Good afternoon, everybody. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started um, so to uh, handle the uh, people that are logged in online. So for uh, those of you in the room and, and also joining us online, uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, presentation that's uh, related to development of therapies for treating uh, the lung complications of CF. My name is Chris Penland, and um, last year I volunteered to moderate a science session uh, on, on uh, Saturday, and I think um, uh, it just um, me being up here today goes to prove the old adage that no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and get started. I think that uh, you'll recognize this first uh, graph. It's a... Uh, on the y-axis, we have pulmonary function, and then on the x-axis, it's age. Um, hopefully, uh, everybody can see the lines fairly well. I, I probably should have made them bigger for, uh, uh, for the online viewers. But the blue line represents uh, the 2% average uh, lung function decline that's seen in uh, the U.S. CF patient population. Now, nobody's lung function decline is this smooth. But I think it's uh, pretty obvious that the uh, cumulative uh, uh, decrease uh, takes its toll. If we had a therapy that was to uh, provide a, an immediate benefit uh, in, in terms of lung function, but had uh, no effect on uh, the rate of loss of lung function, then that would be the gray line. So uh, identifying that uh, type of therapy is um, pretty obvious from the let me see if I can get this pointer to work correctly. From this uh, immediate jump up from the blue line to the, uh, to the gray line at the uh, same age. But uh, cumulative loss still takes its toll. So the benefit of a therapy that uh, decreases the rate of uh, loss of lung function decline, as depicted here in this, uh, come on pointer, red line, um, it takes a little bit longer for that uh, clinical, clinical benefit to become self-evident. Here, I have uh, decreased the rate, of loss, the rate of lung function decline from uh, 2% to 1%, but it still takes three years to be able to identify this uh, difference from the uh, control. Uh, but the, uh, the accumulated benefits over time are, are enormous. And then if we were to have a, um, a therapy that had an immediate improvement in lung, fun in lung function and also decreased the rate of loss of lung function, like in the, uh, I guess this orangish yellowish uh, line, uh, then that would be the best of both worlds. The holy grail, however, is one that is going to give you an immediate increase in lung function and uh, preserve uh, lung function where it's at. So there's no future loss of lung function. So I think that uh, this chart serves a, a very good foundation of what I'm going to uh, talk about here over the next about uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. So I think I'd like to now turn to trying to understand what it is that is, underlies this attrition in lung function. So this is the uh, battlefield in CF. It's a depiction of what's happening uh, in the airway. Uh, normally we have uh, a mucus layer. Um, which resides across the uh, top of airway epithelia, and bacteria and fungi and yeast and other things that we inhale with every uh, breath are trapped within this uh, mucus layer, and they're moved up and out of the lung via the action of these tiny hair-like uh, structures called cilia as they uh, move back and forth and push the mucus up and out of the airway. Well, in uh, CF... We know that we have a, a mucus transport problem uh, because this uh, mucus is thick and sticky, and um, that is owing to the loss of uh, CFTR function. So bacteria uh, that land in here are uh, initially killed, but eventually there either becomes too many of them or they become resistant to the body's uh, natural host defense, and uh, they start to uh, uh, grow and multiply. And so that's colonization. If the bacteria or fungi make you sick, then that's an infection. The body's response to an infection is the recruitment of um, cells from the uh, bone marrow, and um, the first to arrive on the scene are neutrophils. So neutrophils are uh, quite amazing um, 
uh, immune effector cells as they uh, push their way uh, through the, between the cells that line your blood vessels, and then they traverse a number of other obstacles on their way uh, to fight the infection. So neutrophils are both uh, helpful and harmful. Neutrophils uh, kill uh, bacteria and fungi through uh, two processes uh, described here. I'm not really going to go into them, but this is a, a, a photomicrographs of what's happening. But important to both of these uh, killing processes is, a, uh, is this protein called neutrophil elastase. So neutrophil elastase, it recognizes a specific sequence of amino acids in a protein. It then goes and, and at those amino acid sequences starts chopping up the protein regardless of the protein's origin. So bacteria and fungi and the proteins that really give shape to the uh, airway wall all have the specific amino acid sequence. So unfortunately, the neutrophils and their elastase which are coming to fight the infection are also causing the tissue destruction. I think um, we uh, spend a, a little bit more uh, time thinking about this. Um, in CF, for reasons that are still being unraveled, there is a larger number of neutrophils that rush into the airway than would be expected based upon the size of the infection. The more neutrophils that rush in, the more elastase that uh, becomes uh, elaborated into the airway space, the more tissue destruction there is. And neutrophil elastase also causes mucus cells within the airway to secrete more mucus. And so what we have is a process in which there is elastase being elaborated, elaborated into the airway. It's recognizing amino acid, I mean proteins that make up the airway wall and give the airway shape. It starts breaking down those uh, proteins. And what you have uh, in the end, through a process called remodeling, is you have a, a inflammation in the airway wall. So the airway wall is becoming thicker. You have uh, mucus being secreted into the airway. And the combined effect is a decrease in the size of the airway. So when you have a decrease in the size of the airway, you have more resistance to airflow. That's a decrease in pulmonary function. So this is what inflammation is. Eventually, if you have unresolved inflammation, these airway, uh, the uh, muscle cells that are uh, lining the outside of the airway, as well as other structural elements, are lost, and the airway becomes floppy. You can almost imagine it as a wet uh, cardboard paper towel tube. Um, and so when the physicians talk about structural lung disease, this is what they're talking about, an airway that has lost its structure. So based upon what I've just told you, it would seem uh, reasonable that if we were to uh, prevent um, infection and, and uh, minimize inflammation, these wouldn't be important goals for preserving lung function. Main maintaining the status quo, however, is uh, awfully difficult um, to measure because you need something to change to know whether or not you're having the desired effect. Pulmonary exacerbations are really the antithesis of the status quo. These are acute changes in uh, pulmonary signs and symptoms. They're, taught, they're thought to arise because of either uh, new infections or a change in the uh, nature of an existing infection. There's uh, um, aggressive uh, therapy is required, but even with aggressive antibiotic, anti-inflammatory, anti and mucus clearance therapy uh, or techniques, 25% of patients undergoing an exacerbation don't return to their pre-exacerbation uh, pulmonary function levels. I think uh, uh, it's also important to recognize that uh, pulmonary exacerbations um, also have uh, poor prognostic um, uh, outlook in that you have a higher rate of subsequent uh, pulmonary function decline if you have frequent um, exacerbations. So for all these reasons, pulmonary exacerbations are monitored closely uh, and their frequency is a uh, very good means for understanding whether or not your, uh, your treatment is performing as expected. 
So I use this uh, background as a prelude to uh, what may be on the minds of uh, individuals in the audience and online today. And that's this, this question. In the age of CFTR modulators, which we're fortunately in, and you know, many patients uh, are already um, benefiting from modulators, and many more in the future will, do we really need antibiotics and anti-inflammatory medications? So I think it's important that we turn to the data to try and answer this question. So this is a study of what happens when um, Ivacaftor is layered on top of um, uh, normal antibiotic treatment. The study evaluated uh, changes in um, the microbes that are in the CF airway um, before a big, uh, commencing Ivacaftor treatment and one year after commencing Ivacaftor treatment. Somehow, uh, the restoration of CFTR function is uh, creating a modified airway environment that is less hospitable to some organisms, but not all. What we can see is a, a decrease in the prevalence of Pseudomonas, both planktonic as well as mucoid, as well as Aspergillus. But these other organisms, Staph aureus, uh, Stenotrophus multifilia, uh, Haemophilus influenza, and Burkholder cepatia, their prevalence is not changing with Ivacaftor treatment. I think if we look specifically at Pseudomonas and understanding the benefit of layering, on, uh, layering in Ivacaftor treatment, and we uh, evaluate which patients become Pseudomonas free after commencing uh, Ivacaftor treatment, the largest proportion of patients who uh, became Pseudomonas free one year after starting Ivacaftor treatment were those patients in which the year prior to starting Ivacaftor treatment, less th they had uh, what's termed intermittent pseudomonas infection. So that means less than 50% of the time did their respiratory culture score positive for pseudomonas. So I think the take home message from this study is that restoring CFTR function does not sterilize the CF lung. I think it's even uh, uh, more important to realize that even uh, the, the benefits that uh, could be seen by layering Ivacaftor in terms of what's happening uh, uh, related to the bugs in a patient's um, lung is seen in those patients who have intermittent uh, infection, but for those who have persistent infection, there's really not a, a great uh, difference uh, seen when after uh, starting Ivacaftor uh, treatment. If we ask what happens to inflammation um, after beginning Ivacaftor treatment, there's really only been two studies to look at this. Um, the, these studies were conducted in adults with established lung disease, and they gave uh, conflicting uh, answers. But the most positive answer in, in this uh, study here saw that with, uh, after prolonged Ivacaftor treatment, there was a one log or a tenfold reduction in inflammatory markers. So that sounds great, but because the inflammatory uh, milieu is so elevated in CF to begin with, a one log or a tenfold change does not mean that, that inflammation has ended in CF. So I think the uh, take home message here is that uh, CFTR uh, uh, functional restoration doesn't end airways inflammation, especially for those persons uh, with established disease. What we don't know is whether or not starting uh, CFTR early, CFTR modulator treatment very early, or shortly after birth, is going to have an effect on either the uh, prevalence of uh, infection or the establishment of, of inflammation. It's a highly important question because in infants identified uh, via newborn screening, there's uh, demonstrable um, uh, airways inflammation and physical changes, uh, physical structural changes in the airways. And these changes correlate with the presence of pseudomonas, the number of neutrophils in the airway, and the uh, airway levels of neutrophil elastase. So finally, let's look at what happens with uh, pulmonary exacerbations uh, once, you, uh, once a patient has uh, uh, commenced on modulator therapy. So here are the results from the uh, phase three trials of Ivacaftor and G551D patients, 
Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, and homozygous Delta F508 patients, and similar results were observed in the Tizacaftor, uh, Ivacaftor combination therapy, which um, was just um, not too long ago completed. So we see a uh, sizable reduction in pulmonary exacerbations, or the rate of exacerbations, but even with modulators on board, uh, exacerbations are still occurring. So I think if we uh, step back and, and look at what the uh, data has to tell us, it's, uh, I, in my mind, it's pretty evident that um, even with, modul with highly effective modulator treatment that exists now for some patients and many more in the future, we're still going to need highly effective antibiotics and anti-inflammatory treatments if we want to impact that uh, rate of uh, lung function decline I began the day with. So what are we doing at the foundation in terms of uh, addressing these challenges? This uh, graph here depicts our, the number of uh, programs that um, we in, invested in, in in 2017 that are non-CFTR modulator uh, projects. So the number of programs is in the white, and then the uh, dollar value for each of these uh, segments is um, in, in the black text. So um, our investment in these programs typically gets less air time than uh, our investments into uh, CFTR modulators. But I, I hope that I've uh, shown you that the uh, investments in these areas and improvements in inf infection and inflammation are going to have uh, very demonstrable and important uh, changes to the health and well-being of CF patients. If we, so Bill talked about these programs a little bit yesterday, and I'm going to uh, spend um, the last uh, bit of my talk here today uh, addressing them a little, in a little bit greater depth. But before I do so, I want to uh, turn back to uh, this uh, battlefield and, and uh, bring up the issue of where are the logical places to target with, um, with medications. So medications go after biological processes, and you hope that if you uh, have an impact on that biological process, then you're going to be able to measure a clinical benefit in the end. So logical places to go after in, uh, in CF to affect airways disease would be to uh, kill the bacteria, modulate the uh, neutrophils that are rushing into the airway, and then also inhibiting the uh, neutrophil elastase that uh, comes from these uh, neutrophils that is really uh, has a, a driving effect on tissue destruction. If we look at our investments in uh, antibiotics, our investments range from uh, drug discovery up here all the way down to uh, investments in phase three clinical trials. The organisms that uh, we're um, uh, going after include um, uh, Pseudomonas, non-tuberculosis mycobacteria, uh, fungi, um, uh, Burkholderia uh, cepacea, as well as methicillin resistant uh, Staph aureus. So I'm not going to go through each one of these. But I uh, do think it's important um, to uh, bring uh, forward to the group today some, some recent data that's emerging from at least from one of these projects that's focused upon uh, non-tuberculosis mycobacteria, which is a growing problem in CF. So um, NTM infection, or non-tuberculosis mycobacteria infection, is... Um, uh, the, is, the incidence of it is expanding in, in CF and in other susceptible uh, populations. CF patients um, can have either uh, non-tuberculosis mycobacteria abscessus or non-tuberculosis mycobacteria uh, avium. Abscessus is the, um, I guess the uh, one way to describe it is the uh, bad actor of the two, and that's um, uh, because of this increase in the loss of lung function decline that's observed uh, after infection with uh, mycobacteria abscessus. So until about two years ago, there really uh, wasn't much happening in this space. Uh, drug development uh, groups were uh, not terribly interested in, in abscessus. But I think um, after the CF Foundation came out and said that uh, we are 
um, quite interested in, in trying to identify therapies for this organism and with the recognition that it, uh, the, the, prev the prevalence of it is expanding in, in other populations, it's becoming a, a more attractive proposition for uh, companies to, to invest in. One of those companies is a, a company called uh, Curum Pharma. Um, easier to uh, spell than to pronounce. Uh, so Curum Pharma's approach is to uh, take what are um, existing medications and through a process called reformulation, turn them into a drug that can be inhaled. So this is uh, data that um, uh, Curum Pharma kindly provided uh, for me that I could uh, share with you today. And they are looking at um, a drug that right now is uh, only available by uh, taking it uh, uh, by mouth. But they want to uh, create an inhaled version of this so they can increase the amount or the amount of uh, drug in the lung or increase the lung's exposure to the drug. And so in this um, uh, mouse model of a, uh, of a non tuberculosis mycobacteria abscessus infection, what they found is that with um, this compound, that they had a substantial decrease in the amount of um, uh, mycobacteria when they uh, applied the drug directly to the lung, much greater than what w would have been observed if they or observed when they provided the uh, uh, drug um, to the animals uh, uh, via the mouth. And so this um, uh, preclinical data is quite exciting, and it's uh, part of a package that uh, Curum Pharma is using to. Uh, choose which drugs to advance into, into uh, later uh, preclinical studies and hopefully clinical studies in the, in the not too distant future. There are a number of other companies also uh, interested in, in um, as I said, uh, uh, investing in and trying to develop uh, therapies for uh, these um, uh, non tuberculosis mycobacteria organisms, and, and we hope that they find a similar, if not greater, success. So another project, well, uh, actually not another project, let's turn to uh, examine anti-inflammatories. So we have a lot of, an of anti-inflammatory projects, but the, our investments are dominated by um, investing in, in clinical trials. Uh, most of these clinical trials, or essentially all of them really, are dedicated towards, or focused really upon uh, trying to decrease the, the bad actions of uh, neutrophils um, in the CF lung. And in particular, um, I'd like to point out uh, cell taxis, which uh, is right here. They have a very large phase two trial that's going to uh, read out over the summer. And um, this trial is uh, quite large in terms of the number of patients enrolled, but also quite long in terms of the, um, how long the patients are being exposed to the drug. And the reason that they did this is because when they put together their clinical trial, they were uh, really, uh, had a, a reach goal, I would say, in that they're trying to decrease the loss of lung function. So they're trying to impact it, this slope, which takes a lot of patients exposed to a drug for a long period of time to see an effect, like I tried to uh, describe at the beginning. As for data, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, this, comp uh, this compound from uh, Santhera and uh, neutrophil elastase inhibitor. So, this is data from a uh, phase one uh, clinical trial, and what we're looking at is the amount of um, uh, residual neutrophil elastase activity here on the y-axis, and on the um, x-axis we have um, uh, di three different patient, well, four different patient cohorts, three of whom were exposed to uh, a single administration of this inhaled elastase inhibitor. One to three hours after um, uh, taking this elastase inhibitor called POL6014. Um, the amount of elastase activity was measured in sputum samples from these patients, and you can see that uh, there is a dramatic decline in all three um, groups in, in the level of neutrophil elastase activity. At 24 hours, however, the elastase is start, activity is starting to, to rebound. So the challenge for um, uh, Santhera is to uh, examine in uh, future trials whether repeated doses 
of this drug is going to uh, result in more prolonged inhibition of neutrophil elastase activity. And then if they are able to find that, the next challenge is to take this biological effect and design a clinical trial that is going to uh, tell us whether or not there is a uh, clinical benefit to this activity. So I'm going to uh, start wrapping up here. For those of you who um, want a perhaps a simpler uh, take-home message from, from this presentation, I would offer you this. In CF, there's a, a vicious cycle of infection and inflammation. Organisms that uh, come into the uh, 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 CF lung are, are trapped in the mucus and uh, set up an infection that calls on neutrophils to uh, come to the airway to fight the infection, which is the body's normal and natural response. The bacteria adapt, so they become resistant uh, to the neutrophils' activity, but frustrated neutrophils, there's the signaling for neutrophils to keep coming is uh, there, or it continues to be there. The frustrated neutrophils continue to release elastase into the airway, which yields inflammation. That inflammation then results, if it's, if it's not resolved, in tissue destruction. Those wounded airway segments that are, have undergone tissue destruction are future sites, are more probable, or more likely to be future sites for the next round of infection, which is going to start the cycle all over again. And so the challenge for uh, developing inf anti-infective and anti-inflammatory therapies is to break this cycle such that uh, patients can, uh, we can uh, stop this uh, uh, decrease in, in lung function. So as I, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to not only thank you for your attendance, but also uh, hope that um, uh, you were able to uh, understand that it's not likely that infection and inflammation are going to be resolved by a single treatment, um, even with uh, highly effective CFTR modulators. We uh, think that um, uh, that's, I mean, what's the best way to put this? So if CFTR modulators are going to ha have an effect on infection and, and inflammation, then it's very likely going to be uh, observed in very young patients identified shortly after birth. And those patients are only uh, entering CFTR modulator uh, clinical trials right now. But today there are generations of patients who have established lung disease and, persi and persistent infection who are going to uh, need uh, effective anti-infective and anti-inflammatory therapies for uh, years to come so that um, we can break that cycle that was on the, on the last page. And, and really add years to their lives. So I'd like to um, stop here and see if there's any questions that I can address. Yeah, um, I think it might have been in the panel discussion yesterday. Uh, maybe Dr. Skash. I wrote down. Um, Hi. I wrote down that uh, there was a projection that within. 10 years, 50% of patients on modulators would uh, still need treatment for complications. And then after 20 years, it went down to 30%. But what you had said is we don't know if these modulators are going to have that effect on these, these one-year-olds going into, um, you know, to, into the modulator treatment. How are we able to make that projection? So we make that projection based upon looking at... Um, really the impact of uh, these, of Ivacaptor, really, because it's the most effective uh, modulator treatment out there already, and seeing what happens in patients who have G551D. And then we examine well, what does the uh, patient population look like. This is assuming that, um, trip, that uh, triple combinations are going to be as effective, or hopefully uh, more effective than Ivacaptor. Looking at the uh, uh, those patients, as they are born, go on therapy, continue on therapy, and then looking at the uh, totality of the patient population. And so, you know, just like any other patient population, uh, as, uh, as patients age, then we will uh, eventually lose some, and hopefully they're going to uh, be in the 70s and, and 80s. But we're, so we have to take a, a long look at, uh, as patients 
come in, our own effective modulators, and how they start influencing the totality of the patient population. So I don't know if that's a, a real good description of, of how we um, uh, came up with the numbers. It's a little bit of an actuarial uh, exercise, but essentially we were looking at uh, taking the input and looking at the, uh, the number of patients that are coming in and then examining what's going to happen to them uh, years down the road. Okay, thank you. Uh, right here. Just a fast question. You talked about the uh, the NTM medications that they were retaking TB medications and reformulating them. Which one is in that study? So, the oral version of it? Yeah, so. Um, uh, Curum Pharma didn't let me tell you which drugs they're working on. Okay. <laughs> I, I can tell you that they are working on existing drugs. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, over here, and then I'll take one from uh, online. Okay, thank you. Um, do you foresee any time in the near future any investigational drug studies of antibiotics directed at B. cepatia infection and CF patients? Yes. Yeah, so there's um, a, a company, well, let's see, I guess I could just back up, couldn't I? So this company, Alaxia, who's developing inhaled lactoferrin and hypothiocyanate. So the uh, preclinical laboratory uh, studies would suggest that um, that combination of agents um, has a uh, killing effect on Burkhold area. Um, if we also look at uh, this company, uh, Novateris, they are actually enrolling a trial um, um, yeah, so I think that they are actually enrolling a trial to examine the utility of inhaled nitric oxide uh, against um, uh, Burkhold area sebacea. Okay, so let me put my glasses on and read a question from online. Uh, so let me see. I would ask the question, the same question, the efficacy of all the new inhaled antibiotics. Are the drugs dependent on the antibiotic Con contacting uh, the bacteria. Okay, so um, so the antibiotics um, uh, do need to come in uh, contact with the bacteria. Um, most of the antibacterial targets are located inside of the bacteria. Um, you can try and um, have a, a an approach where you poke holes in in, in the bacteria and uh, cause, it, cause the bacteria to essentially explode because of an osmotic effect. But the, bac the antibacterial agents do need to come in contact with the bacteria to have uh, their killing effect. So over here in the green. There's a lot of people in green. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my question, I guess, is twofold. That vicious cycle you showed with the neutrophils and the inflammation. Is our current defense against that, is that pulmazine? So pulmazine seeks to break up um, uh, the DNA that is in uh, mucus, and that DNA is coming from the neutrophils. As okay. the neutrophils die, and also as part of that uh, process I, I showed you earlier called netosis, mm -hmm. they, they essentially spill their guts into the airway. And part of that is their own DNA. And when the DNA is, starts to mix up with mucus, uh, then you have a, a mucus which is much more uh, sticky and difficult to clear. And so what Pulmozyme does is it goes in, it targets the DNA, and it chops the DNA up. But it doesn't have a direct effect on the bacteria or on the mucus itself. Okay, I'm just trying to understand that and then the Synthera drug that you were talking about and how those Pulmozyme versus Synthera and how they would okay. work separately. So Synthera, their POL6014 compound, it inhibits the elastase which comes from the neutrophils. So elastase is causing tissue destruction as it chops up uh, proteins that provide structural rigidity to the airway wall. Okay. So when you if you were to block that activity, then you can maintain structure uh, of the airway and prevent uh, essentially um, uh, the remodeling process to start and, and hopefully 
because you've stopped that from uh, beginning, you're not going to end up with bronchiectatic, bronchiectatic airways in the end. So these, these floppy airways. Okay, so thank you. So they work by two different mechanisms. Got it. Thank you. Right here. Fighting fungal. What work is being done on fighting fungal infections? So, um, this company right here, Polmatrix, they are develop. They are taking itraconazole, which is uh, an antifungal agent, and they are reformulating it so that it can be inhaled and uh, increase the exposure of. Uh, fungi to this known antifungal agent. And so right now they are enrolling clinical trials. They happen to be in, their first trial happens to be in asthma, but we believe that util, if they demonstrate utility there, then um, they should be, it should be able to have a crossover and, and be useful in CF as well. Does that like trichosporin? I'd have to get back to you on that one. Sorry. Right here. Um, is there any work being done on inflammation in the GI tract and liver? So, uh, good question. I think um, uh, the, in, the um, inflammation in the GI tract uh, is not nearly as well as understood as, as what's happening in the lung. It just happens to have been received uh, less uh, research on it. For CF-related research, there's a tremendous amount of research in other diseases, like inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, um, but we do believe that uh, a lot of it is uh, related to uh, the neutrophils, and we do believe that there is the possibility that there uh, could be bacterial overgrowth in the intestines of CF patients. And so if we had uh, effective um, oral uh, antibiotics, we could tamp down that uh, bacterial overgrowth and reduce the, really the, the request for neutrophils to come into, uh, into, the, into the gut and, and cause inflammation. Related to, um, I think liver disease was the other one. So I think there, um, the, the, the path from uh, uh, CFTR dysfunction to uh, uh, inflammation that's happening in the bile ducts it's probably analogous to what's happening in the airway. The bile is not moving. You have uh, uh, this, this static uh, environment is uh, calling for neutrophils to come in, and, that, and there is uh, inflammation going on there. It would be uh, a little bit more difficult to target um, anti-inflammatory agents directly to the bile ducts, but we do believe that uh, modulator treatments are going to have an impact by getting the bile to start flowing again and uh, decreasing uh, the, the signaling for inflammation there. Chris, time for one, one last question. Okay. So um, determining what type of infection is very important in order to know what one of these antibiotics to use. and. Um, Right now, what we're dealing with in the lungs is either deep throat culture or um, bronchoscopy. And according to my children, there has to be a better way. Is there any research being done on a better way to figure out what is happening in the lungs? Yeah, good question. Um, so as bacteria grow and multiply, they give off a metabolic signature. That metabolic signature is... Um, being evaluated as to whether or not we can uh, measure it uh, in exhaled breath. And so if, if we could uh, identify uh, the types of organisms which are the most metabolically active in the lung, and if those organisms were the same ones that are causing the patient to be sick, then um, correlating uh, these changes in, in what you're measuring in the breath um, versus what's happening physically in the lung would be a boon to uh, trying to uh, diagnose what are the causative bugs, if you will. Um, one issue with that is that any time you exhale, you have to, th that breath comes through your mouth, 
and it uh, doesn't matter how much you brush your teeth or swish with Listerine, your uh, mouth is still uh, um, quite a bacterial uh, loving environment. And so how do, we, how do we not get this signal mixed in with this signal and, and, and give us the, uh, the right answer? So that's what, uh, that's what we're working on right now. So I'm getting the uh, uh, shepherd's hook, shepherd's crook signal from the back. So um, thank you for your uh, participation and great questions, Stephanie.